Good afternoon, this is Sean Golding with Golding & Golding continuing our under 10 minute series. Let's focus a little bit on foreign trust reporting. Foreign trusts are complicated. It's not like just reporting a foreign account for FBAR or FATCA. There's a lot more that goes into it. The definition is complicated. The IRS hates foreign trusts. They think everyone's sheltering money in your offshore asset protection trust and Nevis or things of that nature. So let's kind of walk through the basics. First, who is a U.S. person for reporting purposes, right? Typically, it's going to be three categories, U.S. citizen, lawful permanent resident, foreign national who meets a substantial presence test. The latter category typically includes um, or focuses on visa holders. So you're here on an L1, H1B, work transfer, or work visa. Maybe it's a B1, B2 tourist visa. Maybe it's an EB5 investment visa or E3 uh, Australia visa. The purpose is that it includes all different types. It's not just work. A lot of people think it's just if you work here, but that's not necessarily the case. If you meet the substantial presence test, you're treated just like a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. So first thing taxpayers should try to do is avoid being a U.S. person for tax purposes. If they can, then they can forget about this stuff while they meet that, that exception. If it's substantial presence, typically it's going to be an 8840 closer connection. But if you don't meet that, there's other exceptions on form 8843. If you're a lawful permanent resident and you reside in a treaty country, let's say, maybe you qualify to be treated as a non-resident under the treaty. And under the proposed regulations, um, the U.S. government may be amenable to you not having to report for the time period that you qualify as a non-resident alien under the treaty. So if that's for the full year, then you can maybe avoid the reporting. Foreign trusts come in all different shapes and sizes. You have your grantor, your non-grantor, your vocable irrevocable, maybe it's an offshore asset protection trust, maybe it's a charitable trust. All different types of foreign trusts have to be reported. The two main forms that have to be reported on is the Form 3520A and the Form 3520. 3520A is for U.S. persons who have ownership of a foreign trust. 3520 is, is the same thing, but additional requirements as well, depending if you receive a trust distribution, large gift or inheritance, etc., etc. Filing a Form 3520 for a foreign trust can be very complicated because foreign trusts, as I said, they come in all shapes and sizes. And one main category of foreign trust is also pension. But presumably the administrator of your foreign pension is not going to give you the breakdown that you need to file this form substantially correct. So when you're filing the form, it's important to note that you need, you know, balance sheet. It's got to be, you need an income statement and Depending on the complexity of the trust, that could be simple. It could be difficult. Maybe it's a pension trust. You can't get the information. Maybe it's a huge trust with lots of beneficiaries and the balance sheet goes on forever. Maybe it's like uh, you're in Australia or New Zealand. You just have a trust with one mutual fund in it or a pie fund or something. And so maybe it's not that bad. But reporting is much more complicated than some of the other forms. So ideally, if you can avoid having to report these forms, you would. So let's assume you're a U.S. person for tax purposes, and so the substantial uh, presence test, you meet that, you don't qualify for a closer connection or a treaty election, so what do you do? So there are some automatic exceptions, and then there are some other exceptions, so let's walk through it. Revenue Procedure 2014-55 is specifically for Canadian retirement plans like an RRSP, RRIF. Now, even though it's a retirement plan, technically it's a trust. Uh, it has all the makings of a trust. So taxpayers would have to file a 3520 for an RRSP, which is absurd. So the IRS created a specific revenue, Treasury created a specific revenue procedure, which said, hey, you still have to file it for the FBAR, and you have to file it for Form 8938, but you don't have to do the 3520 and the 3528, which is a big relief for taxpayers. So if you qualify for that, that's great. But, you know, with the globalization of the world market or the U.S. market and so many different people or U.S. persons these days living in the U.S. and abroad with invest trust all over the world. The IRS doesn't have the time nor the resources to create specific revenue procedures for each country and each asset category, right? So instead, in 2020, they created Revenue Procedure 2020-17. And basically what that says is certain types of deferred savings plans and pension trusts that you would have to report may not be reportable if you meet the threshold requirements. Now, there's a lot of different elements that you have to meet. It's not just as simple as, oh, I think this one qualifies, right? 
working through it, uh, depending if it's retirement or non-retirement, can impact whether you'll qualify for the exception or not. Expanding upon Revenue Procedure 2020-17 is in 2024, the IRS released certain proposed regulations involving 3520, 3520A, foreign trust regulations, and basically what it says is many of the same things that Revenue Procedure 2020-17, but it expands it. Uh, more individuals who have foreign trusts may qualify. Um, if you meet, uh, if you're considered a non-resident alien under a treaty, you may be able to qualify. You may not have to report all the distributions unless certain threshold requirements are met. So it helps reduce the paperwork. It helps eliminate the 3520 reporting for certain taxpayers, but not everyone. So for taxpayers who are out of compliance, there's various programs the IRS has developed to help you get into compliance. If you're willful, the voluntary disclosure program is basically your only option if you're going to voluntarily comply. If you're non-willful, there's a lot of other options available. There's the streamlined procedures, delinquency procedures, and possibly reasonable cause if you qualify. We've got a ton of free information available on our main website and our sub-websites. You can always reach out and schedule a reduced fee initial consultation if it's appropriate to your matter and it's something that we handle here. Again, my name is Sean Golden with Golden and Golden. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day.